Aaron, you ready? Yeah. Yeah. Aaron, everybody ready? Manistee City Council work session for Tuesday, May 9th, 2017 is now called to order. Uh, work session items. Uh, we have one, two, three, five items. We've got a discussion on not profits using uh, city facilities. We've got a discussion on Fifth Avenue Beach. Medical marijuana request by attorney Mark Quinn, DDA tax increment financing, and Salt City Rock and Blues Band shell concept plan for First Street Beach. Uh, at this time, uh, any one from the public that would like to comment is welcome to come forward, uh, state your name and address, uh, and have five minutes to speak on any agenda item. Is there anyone that wishes to make comments on agenda related items? If not, before, we, before we get into okay. this, uh, I would like to uh, ask the council if we could, their thoughts on moving the uh, item F, Salt, uh, Salt City Rock and Blues, Bandshell, to the uh, A or B. Item A? Item A would be fine. Does anyone object to moving no item F to my item A? Well, be actually. Okay. Okay. We'll just uh, switch the two of them. Mr. Taylor, do you have any objection to that? No. Okay. Okay. We'll make uh, Salt City item A and B. We'll make. Uh, <coughs> And we will start with uh, Salt City Rock and Blues Band Shell Concept Plans at First Street Beach. No, but that's for you. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Robbins. How you doing, Paul? Good. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> My name is Paul Anderson. I am the uh, this year's president of Salt City Rock and Blues. Quick little background, Salt City Rock and Blues, the group came together back in 2012 as we prepared to put on a concert at First Street Beach during the 4th of July weekend. Thus, the concert was fairly su successful. We donated $10,000 to the Lighthouse Restoration Project. We did it for three more years. In all, we donated 17.5 to the Lighthouse, another 5,000 to the Humane Society, and a few small things to a couple other nonprofits. This year, we'd like to step it up a little bit. We formed a corporation so that we can have a bank account. And we'd like to pick a new cause, and that is the beach, um, the waterfront stage area. Waterfront stage area has been on the Parks Department plan for a long time. If you look to the last page on that handout I gave you, there's a drawing there done by Abin March back in 2009 and it shows the waterfront stage area. It's still on their plan, but it looks to be several years out at this point. We would like to use our concert along with other fundraising, donations, and hopefully some grants to speed this process along, create an escrow account, and finance this stage for the city to be used for the city, for the community. Um, our plan, our hope, is to get things started with this year's concept, with this year's concert not concept, and uh, start an escrow account. That escrow account, as it starts to build, we'll be able to use it to uh, architectural drawings and other startup costs to get a better idea of what it's really going to cost to build this stage and hopefully get things rolling and 
eventually turn over the escrow account to the city to build that stage. The only thing we would be hoping is that we'd have enough input to at least make sure it fits our needs and that hopefully we'll be able to use it in the future. Um, so this has already gone be before the Parks Department and has gotten a yes for the concept. We are still at the early stages. What we're looking for tonight is just sort of a, a nod to say this sounds good to the city because we want to use this concept in our marketing and as we go forward. So we don't want to start advertising that we're doing something without city approval. And that basically sums it up. I have some questions. Um, and just for, for in the effort to be totally trans transparent, full disclosure, Paul Anderson is also an insurance advisor to me. <laughs> so I thought I'd better get that out of the way in case there's a conflict of interest. Um, I'm curious, how much seating do you anticipate? Can you ballpark how much seating you have? How much what? How much seating there would be available for the concerts with the shell involved? Right now, um, I know, so the concerts we've been putting on, we don't have 2,000 people there. Uh, this is still what needs to be discussed. This is what needs to go forward. I would think in my head, but I'm not the one doing the ultimate planning, that this would be a pavilion a theater that would be able to be used not just by us, but by Shoreline Showcase, maybe the high school, a few other things, that's what the original plan was. Seating-wise, if it sat 2,500 people, I think it would be more than adequate for Man of Steve. I, I know the concerts in the park down in Lettington, they have a, they have a band shell and they've got a park that they, they do it in, and they get like six, 7,000 people in there. So I've heard, I've not been to one. Uh, West, you know, I've been to a couple of them that West Shore Bank has put on, that they pay for the musicians to come and play. And then they have band boosters go through the crowd and people donate money. So it's no cost to come see the concert, right. but they raise four or $5,000 easily when they do that. So that's why I'm kind of interested in maybe finding out how many numbers of people we can sit there. So just curious, but it's a, I think it's a good idea so far, so I don't want to hog all the time here, so anybody else want to jump in? I think it's a great idea to uh, improve our, our beach area, our shoreline, uh, bring concerts to Manistee, get them away from Ludington. Uh, West Shore Bank wants to bring it here. Unfortunately, right now we don't have a venue. This would fit the bill, so um, I, it's, a, it's an awesome thing that you guys are doing. Um, he, no, just to clarify, you were saying Parks Department. I think you were meaning Parks Commission as well. Um, yeah, I'm a little... That's fine. I just wanted to clarify that um, I am on the Parks Commission and we fully um, support this project. Um, so it's been reviewed by um, Jeff. It's been reviewed by the Commission. So just to clarify that. As I failed to mention, this whole discussion started with Jeff and I about three years ago, and this year it sort of just came to the surface, and we've been successful donating money. We'd like to have a good cause, and we all think this would be a great cause. So is the picture I see, is that the way it's going to be, or is this just a Concept. kind of a rendering of what it could be, or? You want to handle that? I anticipate it. <laughs> The drawing that they included in the handout to you is from the conceptual master plan that was put together through a very involved community uh, uh, project back in 2008. So if you look on that drawing, it anticipated or planned for a stage area in what we used to call the kite flying area. It's kind of the open mode space uh, just south of where the, the lion's uh, shelters are. Um, the, the when when the Rock and Blues approached approached me, and they also talked to the Chamber of Commerce, I think it's important to understand that that the during the Forest Festival we pay four thousand dollars, approximately three to four thousand dollars a year, just in the rental of the stage to hold that event. So 
once a permanent stage is put back in place, um, you know, that helps, helps that, that project also. But basically, what we've talked about to this point is Rock and Blues has a desire to facilitate and fundraise for a permanent structure. We don't have a, uh, we don't have a site plan, we don't have a concept plan, we don't have a cost estimate. So when we went to the Parks Commission, it was simply to endorse the concept of, of a stage venue that would be permanent down at the beach. Um, and, and I've just read through the, the literature that they handed out. What they're proposing is they would like to go forward and start fundraising with the intent of advertising that it would be for a future stage. Once sufficient funds are available to pay for a design, then I think there would be a pretty involved process uh, with all the stakeholders to, to determine where it's at, what it's made of, how many people it sits, um, you know, look at annual maintenance costs and how it can be operated and that sort of thing. But this is really just kind of giving you guys that heads up and looking for an endorsement um, for them to be able to advertise that they're fundraising for a specific project. Jeff, you said this is just down from the uh, Lions Pavilion? That's what the um, conceptual ma uh, beach master plan had it, yes. It doesn't impact any of the parking at, at that location now? Where it's drawn, it does not. In fact, if you, if you look really closely, and I can get bigger images of that drawing if, if you're interested, or even email PDFs, the, the discussion at, at, uh, during the master plan process was to add a row of parking adjacent to the existing roadway uh, so that there was very close handicap accessible parking, but it also created a curb cut into the large bolt launch parking lot so that that parking lot would be accessible and, and could be used for this, this type of venue. But if I'm getting the concept right here, you're to the left of the Lions Pavilion? On the drawing, it would be in a big space yes. before you get up to the uh, pier by the outlook, by the outlook okay. platform. Okay. Yeah, and, and again, that's not to say that would be the permanent position of this, but that's one of the places that it was envisioned back in 2008. Mm -hmm. Can we get Ed to show it to everybody on the thing? Um, we can probably use the document camera. Yeah. Just so everybody, like, you can point to what you're talking about. people in the audience are like, what are we talking about? Okay, I've got, I've got the idea. The, this is the tail end of the, the salt area before the parking comes back in. Mm -hmm. This is First Street right here. So this concept put a stage in this location with the backdrop of Lake Michigan. And then right here, this is just a big mowed grass space today. And what this indicates is ramping to get up on the stage and then kind of a hard surface. Um, I don't know if any of you were a part of that process, but the high school kids that were involved in the process wanted a place to, to have concerts and a DJ down at the beach and a place they could dance. So there was kind of a hard surface here, and then there was a big lawn, open lawn area. And then this is the curb cut I described so that um, some of that parking in the, in the large boat launch parking lot could have a double use and it could be used during those events. So there's not going to be bleachers or anything like that, just open? lawn chair type like they're doing now? At, at this stage, that is just a picture. Okay. So nothing has been designed. We haven't got into any details like that. You, you mentioned permitting process. You said something about permit process. Okay. Is this, I mean, is this just going to be an open, or is, it, is there going to be reservations? I mean, if, if somebody you know, start this project and get it going and, and such. How how are we going to uh, regulate the use? I think those are all very valid questions that would have to be answered by 
kind of the design group that plans and, and programs what that improvement ends up being? I would, would like to, uh, the beach area is a public area. Mm -hmm. um, you know, would like to do, keep away from the concept that someone's controlling something that belongs to the public, as part of the public park. Um, I think I think it's a very interesting concept and it would bring something to Manistee that would be very beneficial to the community. If we had something like that today, the, the process that we have is a special event request. So if the Shoreline Showcase, and, and by the way, they were at the Parks Commission meeting, we're very excited about that kind of a concept where they could seat more people and, and have a bigger presence down there, plus additional parking. But if they wanted to hold their concerts every Tuesday, I think it would be something you would just use the special event. Um, it was brought up at the Parks Commission that is this something that somebody can bring in a, a big concert or something? Well, I think if I think all those things have to be vetted out, um, and maybe some some of our processes have to change. But um, but none of those details have been really discussed at this point. I think what they're trying to ask is if it's okay. You know, can we start it? Start discussing it. Start just um, they don't have anything narrowed down on how to. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, what I want to reiterate is we're not trying to build a stage. We're not trying to take control of a stage. This is a city project. It'll be a city-owned stage. It'll be a city-controlled <coughs> stage. Hopefully, you'll let us use it. Um, but we just want to raise some funds to hopefully see this happen. And the first chunk of funds will go towards all the architectural drawings and the other, th other things that Jeff is going to have to do to see if this is totally feasible. And, Hopefully it will be totally feasible. I saw it happen down in St. Joe where I was for 25 years before moving back. I mean, I see these things, uh, they're all up and down the lake shore. So I think it's a feasible thing. I, I think it's a very generous uh, move on your behalf um, to, to want to you know, raise money and donate it to the city so that we can have a band show. I think that speaks volumes of the integrity of your group. So thank you for bringing it up. I appreciate you. I'm not sure that everybody in town appreciates the fact that you've donated your proceeds back to the community, and that's saying a lot. Um, and I hear you saying that you, you're willing to take on this project, you're willing to work with everybody to try to make it a success. Um, and the only issue I would have at this time, and I think Jeff already addressed that, that it needs to be talked about, and that's how the maintenance would take, be taken care of and that type of thing, which will all come in the future. But I, I don't see any issues with it, I guess. Thank you. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Something we can do with this moving forward. Um, do, we need, do we need a council consensus to, consensus to put it on the agenda as far as approving the concept plan? It's clear that the council would like it to move forward. I think that obviously the proper thing is to maybe talk a little bit more in the Parks Commission about what they'd like to see, you know, work with this group, and just, just start getting our feet off the ground. I would, I would uh, certainly like to see the Park Commission take, take the lead for council uh, on working with the group to develop this. Uh, and they do a pretty comprehensive job. Um, so what do they need from city council in order to be able to advertise that they're taking donations to build this? So that's, I think, part of what they came forward tonight. Well, we could, to try to, the council wishes that we could, we could bring back something for a future council meeting, whether it's a resolution or just a council action, saying that you support their efforts to raise funds for such a project. I'd be in favor of that. I would too. I'd like to see that they have they have some backing and some support and it's it's something that they can tangible they can grab a hold of and say that. Yeah, we can make that happen. Okay. There you go. Yeah, whenever we've we've got an open spot, are you all right with that? Working with 
with the uh, Art Commission. Okay, thank you very much. Um, item C. Oh, item, item B. Uh, discussion of not. Uh, discussion of Fifth Avenue Beach uh, parking lot. So I've got um, just two brief items for you. Uh, the first one is, oops, first one is at Fifth Avenue Beach. This is an older aerial, uh, so it doesn't show the, the shade structures that we installed, uh, nor the sidewalks that we installed in the last two years. And this month we also intend to uh, put out the picnic tables below those shade structures and install the grills. As we were working down there, um, I mean, we've always known this, it's been obvious, but it started a lot more discussion about the existing trees that are in this area. Um, they're not in the best shape. They're not that beautiful anymore. Uh, so we took a step with the uh, Tree Commission, and we have a, a Bruce Shaw who is a representative on the Tree Commission and is in the, the tree business. And we had him look at all those trees and give us an opinion on just the status, the health of them. He basically told us that the trees are, are kind of at their end of their life, if you will. They're not thriving anymore. They're starting for nutrients. Uh, they're trying to send up suckers out of the base of them. And he recommended completely removing those trees, except for this pine tree. However, a windstorm about a week ago tilted that tree over, so Mother Nature said that one's got to go also. <laughs> we then went to the Full Tree Commission and got, wanted to get their opinion on if we remove those trees, what would be appropriate to put back in their place. And we've also taken this concept back to the Parks Commission to make sure that um, they endorsed it. Um, both groups have uh, basically a, a endorsed removing the trees and replacing them with new trees and uh, this is what we're proposing it's called an autumn blaze maple um, we would try to get as large a caliber tree replaced as possible uh, we've got some advice uh, that suggests using our compost to over over excavate the holes would add the nutrients that the new trees would need um, these are very pretty in the fall while they're uh, changing colors and then that's the on blaze phase of it. The reason why I'm bringing this uh, to the council is because sometimes the community resists changes and I'm not sure if this is one of those hot buttons or not, but just thought we'd take that extra step and come before you to know, to see if there was any concerns, issues, and also if this does go forward, those trees are gonna get cut down and people are gonna see it and ask a lot of questions um, our intent would be to cut them, stump grind them, remove them, and replant, you know, all within the same couple weeks. Um, but I just wanted to bring that forward to see if there was any concerns or comments on that. When do you plan on getting this started? We would do this in the fall. Uh, we've talked to Anthony's local landscaping company that's been doing the tree planting um, as our low bidder the last couple of years, and they recommended that this fall would be the best and uh, Bruce from the Tree Commission agreed that that would be the best time to plant. So about how many trees are you anticipating you'll have to plant? We went down there with the landscaper. Um, they thought 12, oh, okay. 12 would be perfect in there. Isn't that gonna create a lot of leaves? <laughs> what happens with the leaves? It's sand, it's leaves, it's, I don't know. <laughs> You're not wrong, they will. <laughs> but these trees are not, are not the, the tree, the specific species of the tree is from the Tree Commission's approved list. Um, they're not a real dirty tree, and leaves are just yeah. part of what we do in the fall. What size are they going to be? Um, 
Um, plan. My my understanding is they're looking at about a two inch, uh, two inch diameter trunk on them. Yeah, what, when you plant them, are they going to be six inches tall or? Um, I, I don't know the height of them. Okay. Landscapers go by how how the diameter of the trunk of the tree. Okay. So we're looking to we're looking to do the the biggest tree that that we think would would thrive there. To be honest with you. What's what's the cost of it then? Uh, they're just under three hundred dollars a tree. So that would come out of our annual uh, tree tree planting budget. Do we have enough money in the budget for that? We we will in the upcoming budget, yes. And it would happen in the fall after the season. Correct. Well, it would happen in the fall, um, and we would take the recommendation of the landscaping uh, company. Now, I don't have a maple tree in my yard, but I'm going to have to go out and scrape up all the seedlings that have popped up from my neighbor's maple tree in my yard. Yeah. Same thing you were asking, right? About seedlings and leaves and stuff. Man, they're going to sprout everywhere. But they, these are a clean tree. It's my understanding they are. Yes. Tell me about the burn. That's the next top. Right? <laughs> are you ready for that one? I'm ready. Okay. So the next topic is a little bit further to the north, but still staying at Fifth Avenue Beach. Um, again, this is a little bit older aerial and it was uh, taken in early spring, but it kind of presents the points that I wanted to make. Um, right now, this parking lot is striped diagonally, and it's kind of a one-way loop as you come around. Um, you can see some of the snow fence that was still up. The sand migration is a constant daily, weekly issue for us, and we do our best to keep it cleaned up, but we'll clean it one day, wind blows overnight, and we've got sand the next day. What happens during the summertime is you get accumulations of sand. Once that sand comes out onto the parking lot and cars come in to park, they stop usually at the edge of that sand, unless they're young kids with a truck or something. And we find that we get uh, the back end of the vehicle then is out in that, that lane. And during the summertime, we get a lot of congestion and issues down there. So uh, later on, I've got some slides on the kind of the concept that we're looking at to improve that. But the, one of the big issues that, that I have right now that our department has is this accumulation of sand. And for decades, we would periodically remove that, that sand, it blows back, the grass grows up, the grass traps more sand, and then, it, then we would take it out and it grows back up. Um, and this is at the parking lot level looking to the east. You can see how it's built up. Um, all the residents on the other side have actually approached us and they usually do on an annual basis requesting that we remove that berm. Um, this little dip in it right here is simply where those residents or the people that park down below walk up over the berm and through so there's no vegetation there. And about five years ago, we removed this section and then the process was stopped. And it was stopped because there was, there was council discussion about it. Um, I wasn't privy to what that was, but the, I believe the residents requested that the berm be removed. Um, council discussed it on one of their annual bus tours. Uh, there were some uh, concerns about soil erosion and how to stabilize that. And so ultimately, nothing has been done there, and I'm actually looking to remove this again. So this is the berm looking uh, to the south from the Coast Guard station, and what we would like to do is take the sand right from the, the parking lot level and just slope it right down uh, to the sidewalk that's here. This was taken earlier this spring. These are actually parking spaces down here there's a sidewalk that's at the base of it. If you go there today, you can see that we've cleaned back to that sidewalk, but then there's just a sheer face of sand as it dries and literally on a daily basis it falls in. And, I, and we just, we, we would have to go down there every single day in order to keep those parking spaces open and that sidewalk clean. As we move forward, um, <clears throat> What I would like to do, and, and I will show you a picture. This is a picture of the 
uh, the gravity block wall that's at Arthur Street. We've also done it down by the softball fields at First Street Beach. Ultimately, what I would like to do is put a short wall, uh, like three foot, that's at the interface between the parking lot and the beach, kind of like the, the block wall that we have down at First Street Beach. Um, it doesn't trap all the sand, but it, it traps a lot of sand, and it makes it a lot easier for us to keep the, the lawn areas clean. And then in the berm area, what we uh, have conceptually drawn here is a just a shorter wall, and then a little retaining wall uh, down at the bottom. If you look at the cross section, this would be the, the beach area, this would be the wall between the parking lot and the beach, the parking lot, and the short wall, and then a retaining wall so that we hold that sand and we're not having to continuously remove and replace and load it. So that's a long-term thing. Um, we're just working on these drawings. I don't have cost estimates for that. But really what, what, uh, what I'd like to do, and, and I'm here before you just to see if there's any concerns from council is removing this berm uh, so that we can maintain it the best we can today. What's interesting to me is if you go, you know, you go past this parking area and you head down towards the Coast Guard station, you find a lot more sand going across the street and into people's yards. If you remove that berm, is that sand going to end up in that nice white two-story building there? Well, uh, honestly, it's almost equal, the, the sand impact along that whole stretch. Uh, and, and, you know, maybe that's something else to discuss, but in, in the past, the city has actually backbladed sand out of those driveways to try to help those I bet they uh, appreciate citizens. that. They do, um, but it's on private property. And, you know, so we have not done that this year. I think actually some got done last week, but, um, you know, I'd also like, know the council's opinion on that if they have any issues with us helping those out uh, as opposed to them hiring a uh, contractor every time the wind blows. Because really what they do is they bring the sand out to the street and we haul it away anyway. And for a couple extra minutes we can just take care of it at once. When you I, did it before Jeff, was there a waiver or anything signed just in case there was any damage? I created? think it's just something that the guys did. Okay. Uh, but yeah, those are the type of things that today I'm concerned with is damage and public perception of it. Yeah. I, would, I would have a concern along with uh, Mayor Pro Tim Zelinsky. Uh, if we remove the berm now, before we put the retaining wall up on on the water side mm -hmm. and, and build the other structures, is, is it all this migrating sand going to complete, completely across and, and into the private residence? Uh, well, there's, there's two things. One, the, the new grass will reestablish itself there. And number two, um, we don't do it during the summer, but in the fall and spring, we, we strategically set up snow fence to try to uh, to try to stop that seed from it. migrating. But but I will tell you with, with with everything in my heart, there's no way we're going to stop the sand. It was, a, it was a crazy year this year anyway. We didn't have the snow. We didn't have the. The hard freezes to, well, the to, hold it, yeah, to hold the sand like it usually does. And the weather systems fluctuated. Normally we set up all that snow fence to capture the prevailing winds out of the northwest. This year we got it out of the northwest, then we get it from the south, then we get it from the west. And, um, so we would, we would continue to do those normal techniques, but, but uh, this, I think this picture demonstrates that that berm is an accumulation of sand, but it doesn't stop the sand. Once it fills in this area down here, it's going right across the street. Anyway. I see, I see that. But what I'm saying is, if you knock the berm out, and the sand that migrates across is going to go straight into the private residences. So, um, looks looks like something that we need to kind of work in conjunction and make sure all the private property owners are, are, are aware of what the process is and what comes out. They, they did approach us, so they made it to take that berm out. I think that's what you said. Yeah, they call every year. Yeah. And when we, even when I drive by there, uh, the residents will, will pop out. How many, How many residents have, have contacted you on that? I, I wouldn't speculate on a number, but okay. I would say at least four or five. Okay. You know, and if you drive down there, there's, I mean, there's a vacant lot here. Um, there's a lot where they have planted new grass and have given up on it. 
they, they shovel out their sidewalk. There's a couple that have fences around right. it. And they put plastic up and stakes. Yeah, there's one that's got still fen or, uh, yeah. still fence that they put up each year, several rows. I don't have a problem with the berm. Personally, I, I think it obstructs the view of people driving down through there, and it would be nice to have that cleaned up. And I really appreciate you mentioning about maybe helping those people that the sand does accumulate. Um, some of those some of those houses this year, I mean, I'd never seen sand so deep. It was really deep in their driveways because of what you just said. Well, one, uh, resident, one resident on the corner paid to have it removed, and I, literally two days later it blew back in. <laughs> so, you know, the help you, you, that you guys, the DPW does, I'm sure they appreciate. Um, removing the berm in conjunction with working with the residents and uh, signing a statement like Mr. Willis talked about or something. Uh, yeah, I, I think it'd be nice if you sent all those homeowners a letter to outline the plan, uh, take a proactive approach to tell them how you're trying to eliminate this problem of the, of the migrating or drifting sand. Um, to, and this is what's going to be happening at such and such a time when you decide to go ahead with it. And that way, at least they've been advised. So. Um, it's pretty awesome to go down there on a windy day and watch that sand move. I mean, you can actually watch it build up. It's kind of kind of interesting. It is not pleasing to the eye, the berm. You know, it's, it's, it, it is a maintenance nightmare. Yeah. The other thing that we've done uh, almost, well, almost every year we have some of our local contractors and our landscapers that will request actual beach sand. Um, and what we've done in the past is we've just swapped them uh, sand that we can use for construction and materials for beach sand that we can't use for any other construction purpose. And uh, so we've reached out to several contractors in the area and there's some interest that if we're, if we do proceed with removing that berm, we would load their trucks, they would haul it away, but it would save on, on our expense of fuel. And, yep. And you know, wear and tear on our trucks. Yeah. So what are you, what are you asking, Jeff? Do you want a head nod or something or just well I, I mean certainly we I, I'll make contact with those residents um, it's just a touchy subject I know it came before council before I just wondered if there was any any strong concerns with us moving forward with removing that and kind of maintain it the way we, we need to well just playing devil's advocate I know some people that don't live at the beach might have problems with you helping the residents um, you know maybe for instance, they have a lot of leaves in their yard and the city's not helping them with the help of the sand and that's nature. So I think that's one of the things that included sand is um, we'll probably get some resistance too when people find out, well, we're helping them at the beach. Why not? Why aren't we helping other people? Well, I think what it's going to do is it's going to save the DPW some time and money from having to constantly clear that off and clear the parking space because they keep them open in the sidewalk. So I think they have to take an aggressive, have to make an aggressive plan to stop that sand from going across to keep it clean, and that will save them some time. And I'm in total support, but I just wanted to bring that to people's attention that that might happen. And, and, that, that's, and that's a good that's a good point to bring up to them if they do say that we're trying to save the city some money and this is the way to do it. Yeah, legally there may be some re responsibility for us because it's coming off of our property. As of today, we, we've kind of taken the position that we're not going to remove the sand for them. We can explore that on a legal basis a little further. We don't run into any uh, dune issues or anything? Uh, no, are we critical dunes? Yeah. I don't think those are critical. Yeah, there was a critical dune section that was further to the north, but there's nothing in there now. Well, this is a man-made dune no. anyway. Isn't there? Right. There's actually... When we take that out, you'll actually see there's old tree planter boxes in there. <laughs> in that area, that's, area that's too. exposed again. Yep. So. Yeah, there's a, there was a driveway that actually ran through here. There's trees uh, in, with big timber planters in there, but over time it just accumulated. And I don't believe there's even a water spring in there. So I guess, um, you know, if you could send a letter to the homeowners. Knowing what what the city would like to do, and, and then we could you know you could bring it back to city council. I mean, if, if that works, yeah. I think that's probably the best plan. I don't want to 
I mean, I want to get in a situation where we're going to spend a lot of time and energy mitigating a, a condition because it is removed, um, and, and I don't know what it's causing causing the city for maintenance. Um, got a long-term plan. You, you often can't do everything at once, so there's conditions to live with, and I would go along with Councilmember Whitliff. I would certainly make sure that we've got a waiver for for damages if we're going to assist um, in any sand removal from private residences. To Perhaps I could suggest that we sit, we have uh, the DPW send that letter and absent any major uh, problems with the homeowners, just go ahead with it and save another appearance of the agenda, on, on council's agenda. So if we, if we get no pushback from the majority of the, the residents, just move forward and work on getting that signed waiver for uh, removing sand. That would be a good thing. Okay. I, I would go for that. Okay. And then you'll see in the, in the, okay with that? Yeah. In the capital improvement plan in the, in the budget, there is, we've started to, to program some of those future improvements as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Item D, medical marijuana request by attorney Mark Quinn. So it was, uh, council, I was at, uh, approached by attorney Mark Quinn, wanted to have some time with the council at a work session to bring up the changes uh, in the medical marijuana law. And not certain where he wants to go with it, which is education or otherwise, but let him have his say. Thank you. Uh, I'm Mark Quinn. I'm an attorney in town, and I have uh, some people, some clients who are interested in the new Medical Marijuana Act that's been enacted uh, and looking at uh, contacting governmental authorities uh, regarding that. I don't know what familiarity any of you have or don't have with the act, so I'm going to start and just give kind of a basic overview of the recent uh, bills that have been enacted and that are due to become really operational at the end of the year. Uh, what it, uh, the Act provides for, there's already medical marijuana as we're all aware of, and that is where you have a caregiver and you have a patient and the caregiver can have so many plants per patient uh, and, and so forth. This is taking this somewhere closer to where Colorado is, and I think we're all familiar with what Colorado is doing uh, or what they've done in that regard. And I realize there are various issues on marijuana. Some are for it, some are against it. And, and, and this is not a, a lobbying effort to say you should be on board with medical marijuana, anything along those lines. There are basically, uh, under the statute, first off, if the city does nothing, then nothing will happen in this regard. The city has to be proactive in, to the extent of enacting an ordinance to allow for something to occur under the new act. So uh, no action means it doesn't happen. What is authorized under the new act uh, are five different types of what are called the medical marijuana facilities. One is a grower, one is a processor, there's a secure transporter, there's a provisioning center, and there's safety compliance. All this will be monitored and governed and subject to uh, the Department of Labor of the State. Uh, it is, there's a system that is required to monitor seed to sale, uh, to make sure that I don't come in and buy five pounds of marijuana and then I go stand on the corner and sell it or anything along those lines. Uh, it is subject to uh, any of these facilities that are authorized and permitted are subject to basically, as I read the law, 24-7 uh, examination by uh, either the state or by law enforcement to make sure the act is being complied with. Uh, so there, I, th I think many people that I've spoke to before at other places, there's the concern that, well, I'll sell this properly, but I'll deal this out the side. Uh, will that happen? Probably so. People get greedy. But if they do, they're going to lose uh, the license, uh, they would be subject to criminal prosecution, uh, and it would be the end of that very quickly. A grower is a grower. Uh, you grow the marijuana, uh, and that can only be done in an agricultural or industrial zoned area. 
Uh, my guess is there's nothing agricultural in the city, uh, so it would have to be a, an industrial area for the growing of marijuana. What my clients were more interested in was not really in growing it here. They live in, in different places and they have spots where they can do this. Uh, and, and some of them already are growing as caregivers. Uh, a processor uh, is, let me make sure I have the right terminology for this, because this one always stops me. The processor is uh, the uh, a commercial entity located in the state. It purchases marijuana from a grower. It extracts the resin or it creates a marijuana-infused product uh, brownies, if you will, uh, that's what a processor does. There's a provisioning center, which is the grocery store for these products, whether you're going in to buy uh, marijuana in the traditional form or you're going in to buy one of these uh, brownies or edible or anything along those lines. There's a safety compliance facility where the marijuana has to be and the product has to be submitted to, it's tested, I'll level with you, I don't have a clue how they test it, but it's for purity and to make sure that it doesn't have other chemicals or, or things that shouldn't be in it. Uh, and then there's a secure transporter. The secure transporter is similar to the Brinks truck that you see. You have to have two people, somebody has to be in the truck at all times, and you can't be a car holder, uh, you can't be involved in any of these other uh, things that are permitted under the statute. Uh, and what my clients were really looking at from this perspective was the provisioning center or uh, maybe the safety compliance facility. But, but primarily it's the provisioning center uh, or the processor to, to do that. And again, what happens is under the act, if I'm interested in doing this, I have to submit my application to the state of Michigan uh, and when I submit my application, I have to tell them basically everything about me. If it's a business, everybody that's a shareholder, everybody that's involved in the business, spouses, uh, they want to know everything about who is involved in this thing. If you have felony convictions or misdemeanor convictions for controlled substances, you're not getting anywhere. <coughs> I have to submit to the state the ordinance that says I am permitted to do this. If there's an ordinance that is in effect, it can say one provisioning center in the city, 30 in the city. It can limit the numbers uh, for, for each one of those different uh, aspects that are applicable to it. It goes through the process. The state is the one that issues the license to the person. Uh, and as I said, there's the monitoring system that is really, it, it's not developed yet, but I believe they're looking at Colorado for the monitoring system they have there that it will monitor the sale, it will monitor when I grow it, it will monitor when I take it to the processor, if I take it to the processor, it will monitor when it goes to the provisioning center, and it monitors when I come in to buy the marijuana or the product. It, it, this, it, everything is governed so they can check to make sure, that, as I said before, that I have the amount that is permitted under the, under the Act. Uh, there, is, there are fees that the governing body can charge. Uh, there can be a $5,000 application fee to the local governing entity. Uh, there are uh, fees that have to be paid to the state. Those have not yet been determined. I did hear at some place else I was where I think Pennsylvania was charging like $100,000 to submit your application to the state to be able to do this. It seems kind of high to me, but uh, I think that could be done here. What that means to me is that if you're going to be doing this and you're putting that kind of money up front just to see if you can do this, you're going to have people that are going to be following the laws and following what they're supposed to be doing instead of trying to make an extra hundred bucks out, out the back door with it. There are also uh, a 3% tax and that's part of the reason for monitoring uh, all the sales and so forth uh, that, that applies and that money uh, will go to the state uh, and what will happen will go into an excise fund and not part of the general fund 
and 25% of the, the revenue will go to the municipalities with the facility allocated in proportion to the number of facilities within that municipality. 30% will go to the counties where the facilities are located. 5% goes to the counties, but it's earmarked for the sheriff's department only. It doesn't affect any other monies that the sheriff's department receives from other sources. I don't know if the city has anything to do with funding county sheriff or not at this point. 5% of it is to train local law enforcement through a training program. 5% goes to the state police. 30% is to go to the state and after October of this year it's for a first responder uh, presumed coverage fund within the Workers Disability Compensation Act. Don't ask me what that means because I don't have a clue to be truthful. Uh, and my clients were interested in having me approach this body and, and other bodies within the county uh, to hopefully shed some light on the subject to let everyone know that this act, these acts are there. Uh, there is a thought that this will grow more, that there will be counties or townships that will jump on board and enact ordinances and that there will be substantial revenues they will generate from that. If that does happen, uh, I'm not certain where the drawbacks and negatives come uh, because if someone lives in the city and they're going out to Manistee Township or somewhere else to, to do whatever they're doing, the, the substance will still be here. I mean, marijuana is what it is. Uh, again, I'm not advocating for the use of it uh, or against the use of it, uh, but I think we're all well aware that it exists and it doesn't seem to be going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, and it didn't go anywhere when it was completely illegal to do for a lot of people. Help me stay in business a little bit. Uh, but that's kind of an overview of what the act is. Uh, it's, there are, uh, obviously, with any enactment from legislature or ordinances from the city, uh, minutiae and detail that, that, that are there that will need to be addressed and worked out. And you don't know how that's going to play itself out until it probably ends up in the courts to some extent. But it is going to be, as I said, and I don't want to, I'm going to reiterate this, but monitored, controlled uh, with a system that's not yet in effect, but uh, it, it will be monitored from seed to sale uh, very closely is what the statute calls for. Uh, now, as with anything, uh, we can look at this law. I mean, I saw an officer. I can do 35 miles an hour in the city. I might get stopped. I might not get stopped for it. Uh, that's all a matter of, of what happens from that perspective and, and with the state. But, uh, there is a movement towards this and uh, the thought, and I believe this, that if communities or uh, governmental entities are going to be doing this, uh, I do think that from a revenue perspective, it's more of a positive than a negative. Uh, I don't really think that the negative aspects that one might associate with something are as sincere a threat as might be thought to be at the initial, when you're first initially thinking about it. So, if there's any questions that anybody has, I'd be more than happy to try to address them. I have a question. Yes. If the people, your clients or the people that are showing interest, are they, help me here, you may have said this and I just kind of went over my head. Are they talking about a, being a grower? Are they talking about being a retailer? Or are they? What the people that I have that I'm here on behalf of now are growers, basically. They are looking more at a provisional center, a, a place where they can sell what they're growing. A storefront. A storefront, yes. But under the Act, any of those five things would be permitted. Again, I think with the growing aspect, it would have to be in an industrial section. So I don't know if that's the. Uh, the part north end of town there, or, or, or where else it might be. But you're you're basically saying that if if we do nothing by ordinance, uh, nothing happens. You do uh, nothing; if, it stays if as we, is. If we do um, an ordinance, then we have to respond to all five provisions that you've. No, yeah. you can pick and choose. 
you can say we're going to have provisioning centers and that's all we're going to allow. We can have growers, that's all we're going to allow. Uh, it, it's, it's completely the discretion of the board or the body as to what, if anything, is permitted. If, if you had a storefront, it would seem the reason you would also need a transport because it's, it's not going to beam itself there. Someone's Correct. going to have to it's, move it. It, it, and, and I'll level. I'm not quite certain how the transporter works from my growing it to getting it to your store to sell it with <laughs> the governing body saying we're going to allow secure transporters to transport and drive through our community. Because if, for example, if Farther Township permits this, Manistee Township permits something, but Stronic Township in the city don't. It could be a very roundabout way to get from A to B. Uh, I know with the tr transporter aspect, you have to have a plan, uh, a direct route that says where you're going. You have to follow that. You have to carry that route with you when you're transporting any anywhere. And, and you need that secure transporter, whether it's the grower to the provisioning center or the processor or the safety compliance, everything from moving it from A to B is done with the secure transport. Are they armed? The secure transport? Do you know? Nothing in the statute that indicates whether they are or they are not. Okay. Uh, I do, as I said, one has to be in the truck at all times. You can't have any markings on the truck that says marijuana, anything along those lines. So it's, it's similar to a Brinks truck is mm -hmm. what I think would be uh, required. Okay. Could they build a facility that was big enough to do the growing and the processing and the safety, I'm sorry, whatever, compliance part of it as all under all one roof? There are limitations on the grower, and I may have to look through this. Some parts you can't be one in the, one in the same. What I don't know and I think would probably be permissible is I have a pole barn. I rent the first part out to you as a grower. I rent the second part out to you as the processor and then the provisioning center could be to a third person. I, I, the provisioning center I'm not positive on, but I think the other two would be permissible, but they'd have to be secure. They'd have to be, they wouldn't be able to have a door to walk through easy to get to them. They'd have to be two different locations. But I, I would need to check that to confirm. I'm not positive on that. I guess I'm just thinking out of the box, and maybe it's a bad idea, maybe it's a good idea. It depends on people's reaction to medical marijuana. But if we had an empty industrial lot that we could build a building in that had different entrances, that had these things next to each other, there at least it wouldn't be all over there, the city, it would be controlled in one major part of it. There's already been discussion on that possibility in the past, has there not? Well, it had some interest and didn't go far. Um, it's my understanding that, it, that if you were a grower, you could also have a provisioning center, but you couldn't be involved in the transport. That would have to be an independent third party to do that. That's about the extent of it, so I don't think all three of those uses could probably be in the same facility. The grower cannot be a transporter or safety compliance. That I have here. Um, the grower is where you get the jobs. Pardon? The growing process is where you would recreate jobs. Well, I think there's a potential for job creation in all of them. The storefront would, too. If, if you're, obviously, if you're going to have a grow operation, you're going to have to have some highly qualified, highly trained individuals um, that are going to be top top flight people. I think, you know, obviously if you have a provisioning center, there's going to be jobs there. You're going to have transporting. You're going to have people, you know, jobs created there. <coughs> Same thing with the processors. I think there's going to be jobs at every level, some of them, depending on which which part they get involved to be extremely highly trained, well-paid positions. What I read on the internet and what I've looked at is that, and I agree with you, that um, there is some money coming back from the state if you, from the state if you have, if you sell it, you have money coming back. 
you know, maybe you have a tax, like a tax is some of that's going to come back to you. If you're growing it, you're employing people, they have to work there that are background checks are like five miles long. Uh, they just go on forever. They're, they just check all of the background, like you were saying. For, for everything. Yep. Yeah, I mean, they just check everything. Um, it's just something to consider. I, I found it very interesting, the, all the steps that had to be taken. I believe there's some date, magical date, September 15th of this year. December 15th is the <laughs> soonest that people can submit uh, anything into the state. But again, it's contingent upon whether that entity has enacted an ordinance to allow it to happen. So if I submit to say I want to open something up on my office at Maple Street, uh, one of the things I would have to submit is an ordinance that says I can do that in the city. If I don't have that ordinance, uh, the money I paid to them for my application is money I've thrown out the window. So I guess some things to consider is do you, do you want one available here, or are you going to drive to uh, Manistee Township to pick it up? I mean, that's <laughs> yes. you know, I, I hear Traverse City, and, it, and it's strange. There's, I mean, as the law is now, <laughs> the provisioning centers are not technically legal. I believe Grand Traverse County allows them to happen. I believe Ann Arbor East Lansing allows that to happen, but you go to the adjacent county and you're going to get busted for doing what they're doing across the county, county line. Okay, good, bad, or otherwise, that's just the way it is. And this is going to make this much more uniform uh, with, with what the law is. My, my research shows that there are 26 states that now allow medical marijuana. Um, there are several states that allow recreational marijuana. A uh, recent article, I'm not sure if it was Saturday or Sunday in the Grand Rapids Press indicated that petitions were being done in the state at this time to uh, potentially put the issue of recreational marijuana on the Michigan ballot either in 2017 or 2018. Um, I would think it would be prudent to uh, to thoroughly research and study uh, and find examples of uh, ironclad ordinances uh, and, and be proactive as, a, as opposed to scrambling last minute in a reactive mode uh, doing something uh, that that not very uh, very effective um, and I say that with no judgment on the use uh, in, in any form um, I, I've never myself um, uh, just just hasn't been one of the things that uh, that I've considered in life, but I hold no judgment on people that uh, that find it additionally useful. Uh, I make no judgment uh, on people that, that use it otherwise. The, um, but Mayor Grotem says, you know, there might be some some revenue, and we're kind of correct me if I'm wrong, but I read some literature today about about medical marijuana. And we have some, somewhere in the neighborhood of 200,000 people in Michigan that are licensed? Did I read that correctly? I don't know the answer to that. There are a lot of people that have medical marijuana cards that, in my opinion, don't have it for medical reasons. Okay. <laughs> I think we're all probably, you know, have that thought. I just think the number, of, the number staggered me. There's lots of people that, that get prescribed narcotic drugs that don't necessarily need to be. Absolutely. So. It, and with what you said, I agree completely that, that if this is to be done, I don't think you come back at the next meeting and say, here's an ordinance to do this, uh, and then realize, okay, we need to fill in that blank, we need to fill in that blank. I, that was the idea of coming before you tonight, is to put this topic out there. If there's an interest, uh, you can certainly discuss it, proceed with it to do what you want to with it and make it as informed of a decision as you can because that's what you're supposed to do. Uh, to the extent I can assist in that regard, I'm more than willing to. I'm more than willing to work with Mr. Saylor. Uh, he's, I'm sure, familiar with the statute as well. I think um, I think I would be in favor of, of in having a more thorough discussion and include our city attorney uh, and, and our chief. Um, and, maybe establish what direction we want to go or don't want to go uh, at, at an additional work session.
that, that would be the direction I would prefer. I'm not sure what other people would like to do. We would have to agree. Yeah. If you wish, we could put it on a, an upcoming work session. I'm, I'm against it. Uh, I don't want to put our community in, any, in, in this in harm's way. Um, just totally against it. I don't want to sell out our community for for a few jobs that uh, may occur with producing marijuana or selling marijuana. No, I, no. Well, I I agree with Mr. Willif. I, I'm not. I don't want to sell out our community, but I don't. I want to have enough information that I don't miss an opportunity either. So that's why I like to see it on work session. So I I know all the facts. It's hard to make a decision if you don't even know part of the facts. So. I like to uh, know as much as I can about it before I make a decision. It's, it, that's fair. Do you, yeah, do, you, do you object to having uh, a more detailed discussion? No, no, I just, I just wanted to throw my opinion out there. That, that this is where I stand. Okay. And that was my opinion of getting further into it, not to say yes or no, but just to get more yeah, I just. Well, I'm saying the same thing. I just think that we should have a more detailed discussion and look at all the aspects of it. Um, look more into the act and what the ordinance would have to say yes. It would be a long know. process. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the things that I've encountered before is a, a, a pressure, if you will, that if you want to apply under this act, then you can do so December 15th, so get your ordinance in effect so I can do this when I want to do this. And, and that's not taking into consideration really the governing bodies uh, position to make sure it's a thorough decision and it's an understood decision uh, before any decision is actually made. So I, and if, if it delays the fact, then it delays it. And if it happens, it happens. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. And that's the, the last Michigan Municipal League meeting we went to, they, they had a um, work session on that. I attended that work session. Um, and I understand the complexities of it. And I'm kind of thinking maybe the Michigan Municipal League might have something on their website about that. <coughs> uh, just a place for us to go and look and see and, and read about them. I'd be surprised if they did not. I mean, it's, I mean, it's a fairly hot topic, if you will. Uh, and if there's more information I can provide or whatever, I'd be more than willing to. They said this was just kind of stick your toe in the water and, and let you know that it's out there. and. There's an interest uh, willing to, to do what I can to provide information to help you. Thank you. Thank you. Jim, which one are you going to next? Because we missed discussion on nonprofits. CDA. You don't want to do the discussion on nonprofits? I got switched to L. What can do nonprofits? It's, you know, uh, we just didn't know whether you skipped it. Um, 
I, I reversed you overlooked it or what? So we're bringing it to your attention, that's all. I reversed it. I know I did. Right. I asked this to be put on our agenda, and I think it was during our work sessions. Um, we're going through the budget, maybe. We need to know, I think we need to start really thinking about what our timeline is with the current um, contract that we have, or I'm not sure whether to call it a contract or not. I know there's a, a point in which it expires, and then we have to think about renewing it. Yeah, the tip plans expires in 2020 it's in line with our, our bond expiring and um, I s initiated discussions with the DDA in early 2016 on uh, looking for a successor uh, agreement for our current TIF we had one meeting uh, when the former director left we had one meeting after that and uh, they wanted to put it on hold until they got the new director, and uh, there's been no other overtures from the DDA to sit down and talk about it. So I'm not certain where that is in, uh, in their hierarchy of priorities, but uh, we have had two very preliminary discussions about um, a successor agreement to our current TIP. One of the things that I've been involved with with the DDA is they have a subcommittee for, it's called, we call it the ER committee, it's for the economic redevelopment that I've been on. I don't, except, still don't understand why I was invited to be on it, but I'm on it and Dad is now on it. Um, and one of the things that they have done recently is develop a score sheet for um, businesses coming into town, I wasn't totally in favor of all the points on the score sheet, but it was their start at trying to evaluate a position on how they would feel about, say, the Hollander Project or the Senior Center uh, apartments. Um, and they've used that in scoring, and I think that they may have used this for their basis in their non-endorsement of some of the these developments that come up. One of the things that I think we should do is I think with, we're in a 20, I think it's a 20 year commitment now with the DDA. Right, I believe it's it's your 20 time. years. And we need to also be thinking about, and I, I'm not saying this with any malice or anything, but I don't know how to evaluate the DDA without perhaps doing our own score sheet so I'd like to float that idea that maybe we should have a, a subcommittee to think about how would we go about doing that because I think that's a very big commitment. It's by charter we can, we can dedicate up to two whole mills to the DDA and um, we're definitely at like a mill and a half right now that they're collecting, I think. Um, so. We need to know precisely how well that's being managed and, and have a way to, to see if we can improve the process. I think by looking at a way to score it early on and thinking about this, 
we have an opportunity to improve things if we think things need to be improved and work better with the city. So there's, there'd be some real benefit to, to going through this process. So I don't know how everybody else feels, but that's one of the things I wanted to talk about. I've suggested to the, uh, to the DDA board that uh, an, an update plan uh, is a priority. Um, with the 2020 sun, sunset date coming up, <coughs> that's when their last bond is paid off. Uh, and, and with the lack of extension of their plan uh, or additional debt service, um, they would sunset, as they, uh, as they say. Um, millage, I don't believe the DDA is funded with millage. The DDA is funded with uh, tax increment uh, it is, but it's, of the property. We don't I, I know how it's that. funded, but there's a cap on it that it can't be the, higher than the equivalent of two mills. I read it someplace in our charter. So, yeah, they, they can't just... To kind of baseline the, the, the tax level in, in, as I understand, the DDA is charged with increasing the tax value within the DDA district and they capture taxes above that baseline when when the original agreement was, was made. There's two ways, there's several ways of financing the DDA. Millage is certainly one of them and there is a cap on that, but the DDA is not funded through millage. We can, we can bring that. I know it's that. It's the answer it's, back to council at yeah. the future date. Yeah. but I know, what it, I know what you're saying. I'm sorry, it's, it's not a bad idea um, to create a scorecard for them. I, I guess I would like to uh, go down that road and examine that. Okay. I think it's only fair. I mean, we're asking to do the same thing with the AES. We're not DDA too. Okay. Would you like staff to bring back some conceptual ideas for council to consider? Please. I'd like to. <laughs> yes, please. Okay. So you're looking at evaluating the effectiveness of the DDA? Yeah, I, I mean, we, we have to address it in some way, and I just want to do it in the most fair and objective way possible. Okay. Put it on, right. And, and as uh, Councilwoman uh, Pontiac said, you know, we want to address or grade the AES and, and make it on that level, those, that plane. Any other discussion on Okay, now we are uh, back to the beginning. The, uh, the discussion on nonprofits using city facilities at no cost. Apparently for some time there, there's been a uh, unwritten practice policy of allowing nonprofits to use uh, city facilities at no cost, primarily the marina uh, building. Uh, the seniors use it occasionally for some classes if they have uh, overflows at the, at the senior center, they're allowed to do it at, at no cost. And just recently this weekend, um, I allowed uh, the Selective Service Board in this area to meet in City Hall and do an annual training at, at no cost. Just want to know if, if Council was comfortable in that approach and if you wanted to continue that. I'm comfortable with it. Okay. It's, part of, it's part of the city services. Yeah, I, I would agree. I'm, that. I'm comfortable for meetings I'm, I'm, I'm maybe not so comfortable when they're conducting fundraising activities and using city resources to do that. I guess then what, what, what are we talking about? I'm, I'm, I'm do saying. we have to define what type of non-profit? Well, right now it's just non-profits using uh, for meetings. A, 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 re, a room meetings for, for meetings or and training. I think the only exception is I think the the um, Senior center uses it for some type of a class. They use it for board meetings oh, sometimes. Yeah, but uh, you know, I, that that's the uses that I'm aware of is that they use the marina and sometimes a room in city hall. 
That's about the extent of it. Is there a church running that? On it's Sundays? Marie, yes. Okay. So are we comfortable with continuing with that? And just making that sure would be nice. Yeah, it'd be nice to have a written policy on it, so so it's clear to everybody, and someone doesn't feel excluded because someone else got to use it and they didn't. I mean, not for profit. Um, government. Well, it is scheduled out. Everybody goes through the. Um, yeah, they have some Heather, reserve. Heather schedules it out. Um, is there approval yeah. that they have to get pulled through, or is it just okay? I want it. Can I use it? Then you're on the list. Well, in, uh, before Chief Bachman retired, um, the use was authorized by him, and then they would go through Heather to get um, get the scheduling. And that's that's been working, hasn't it? I mean, it has. Uh, yeah, it has been. I just want to make sure that that was still okay with the with the mm -hmm. council. So the question is, do we need a policy for that? I mean, if if something's working, do we really need to try and fix it? Yeah. Well, how do we know, like, what profit nonprofit? I mean, are we going to end up sharing <gasps> nonprofits free? How do we know when we are charging a fee and? Have we charge when they're non profit when they are a for profit entity, you know. Mostly it's just mostly been the senior centers and occasionally a I think the tight lines for troops have used it for a meeting and what I'm saying is if there's other people that come asking, like church organizations or school or if there's more people that, would that be come the chief up. pretty much approved right. it. Right. The and chief it's, we're renting it long term engagement. And you know, so they they want scheduled times, and so they want it. And there's some cleanups and different things like that. We're not talking about parties and picnics and no, 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 no. Okay. No, those are those okay. are those are the rent for. Okay. Yeah. It's just for the except for the church, which I guess if you want to call the church service a meeting, it's it's a meeting, and uh, we don't charge them. We do charge them a, a nominal fee. Whatever it is to use that. Isn't that nonprofit though? It, it is, but I think the distinction was that it was a long term, all the time, you know, there was. Constant uh, spot. Yeah. So this, so others are kind of getting this. So if it's once in a while, it's not charged, but yeah. if it's recurring, yeah. it is. Whatever. It's pretty much. I don't know, I, I would just say leave it as is. We really need another policy. That's just kind of a layer of micromanagement. You know, we're we're kind of making agreements with the Saints and and the youth center and, and a lot of other things about the use of city facilities and and the guidelines for that and parking lots and <coughs> who's responsible for snow removal and uh, all kinds of concessions. The uh, Is there any liability? Does the city have any liability if someone's injured it, uh, while using our facility? That's that's always a risk. It's part of the. Can you get a disclaimer for that? Or I don't have the answer to that. I mean, it's it's would be similar to any other any other city facility that's used, or you know, it could be a park, it could be the boat launch. People get hurt; they can come after us, and it's just that's the nature of the beast. Use the picnic tables. It's a liability loss, but it's right. part of the services. I mean, I don't, I, I don't, I don't see the difference. I mean, if, if it's, I, I think if you want to put a policy, the policy should be so quick and easy, saying if they need to contact the chief of police, and if he, if he approves it, then they schedule with Heather. Yeah. I mean, if that's a policy and that's what we're doing anyways, that you know, doesn't have to be anything elaborate. I'm not. I just, but I, the fact that you're using them, I'm all for it. It's part of the city services. Mr. Taylor, you, you, I believe you had it put on the work session? The question put on the work session? Yeah, I, I put this okay, on. Okay, so I guess I would ask you what, what, did you have some concerns about it or you no, did? I just want to make sure that, that it's okay with the council. It's been kind of a, a policy that staff has been operating under, and I wasn't aware if they had really had it that 
endorsed by council. So I just want to make sure council was comfortable with that and, and moving forward. I think it's being being handled properly. They're, they're getting the authorizations, uh, and that's fine. And if, I, I guess I, if we run into some issues, we'll come back to council and suggest otherwise. I think that's I fair. Think, you know, I always thought in the past that Chief Bachman handled that because he was the harbor master and was. He, yeah, that's the marina is part of his was part of his oversight. Yeah. He handled it. But as long as you're good with it, we'll continue to move forward. Good with that. Okay. Good with that. Is Thank Tim you. still on the Harbor Commission? Excuse me? Is Tim on the Harbor Commission? He's, the, he's in charge of the Harbor Master. Or, yeah. Okay. Okay. He'll do us right. I just want to make sure he knows that. Is, is there any other business? Adjourn.